Hello folks, my name is Barry Lacey and I am the Historian Residence of Wexford County Council's Library and Archives Service and today I'm going to be bringing you a talk discussing the June 1922 elections in the county. In the months following the ratification of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, debates both for and against it took place throughout the country. In April, both Michael Collins and Emma de Valera would visit Wexford on separate occasions, each drawing large crowds. In an attempt to avoid further division, Collins and de Valera agreed a pact for the planned June elections, which would see both sides campaign jointly. In addition to this, Collins attempted to alter the new Free States Constitution and make it more appealing to the anti-treaty side. While this was somewhat encouraging, however, the British administration was strongly opposed to the new Republican Constitution. Michael Collins then had to withdraw the proposed constitution, which fractured the election pact and consequently saw two Sinn Féin parties anti and pro treaty contesting the election on June the 16th. The election was a success for the pro treaty side, winning a total of 239,193 votes compared to the anti treaties 135,864. The success of the pro treaty side was added to further by a total of 247,226 votes for other parties, which also supported the treaty, and Labour was the largest of these. And the election essentially left the provisional government with a strong pro-treaty mandate. In late May 1922, three parties being Sinn Féin, Labour and the Farmers Party selected and put forward candidates for the June elections. The local newspapers at the time provided detailed coverage of the candidates, as well as their party's policies and agenda, which helps to paint a picture of the differences. One of these newspapers was the Inn at Echo, and on the 3rd of June, it um, reported that on the 31st of the previous month in May, the North and South Wexford Republican executives held a meeting in the Athenaeum in Escorty to select candidates for the Sinn Féin panel. The three current members being Mr. Sean R. Etchingham, Dr. James Ryan and Mr. Seamus Doyle were unanimously selected. All candidates spoke about the need to return to the way things used to be, citing the reorganisation and the cooperation of, of Sinn Féin and the military forces as necessary. Delegates were asked to concentrate on the reorganisation of their own common, with the welfare of the country in mind. It was obvious that the election pact was having its desired effect. A Mr. J.J. Byrne from Cushionstown was selected as the pro-treaty candidate on the Sinn Féin panel after a meeting of the Wexford delegates. At a delegates convention of the County Wexford Farmers Association held in Wexford Town on the 31st of May, the Farmers Party was established to contest the elections. The party was primarily concerned with agricultural interests. The freeness and stability of government was noted in their programme for government, as to a strong agricultural policy such as opposition to the nationalisation of land holdings, support for afforestation and drainage schemes and state loans for small farmers for homes and buildings to name but a few. Two Labour candidates were put forward, being um, Richard Corish, who was a TD and Mayor of Wexford, and a Mr Daniel O'Callaghan from Inniscorty. In a meeting held on the 1st of June, speakers referred to issues apart from the treaty, including the existing large-scale unemployment and the need to create industry. Many of the Sinn Féin candidates for the pro-treaty side during the election in County Bexford were already well-known figures. One of these was Seamus Doyle. He was one of the leaders which previously took part in the Easter Rising in Inniscorty in 1916, where he held the rank of Brigade Adjutant to the Volunteers. Now, when word reached the town of the surrender in Dublin, um, the Volunteers in Wexford refused to believe it. And subsequently, after consultation with the British Army, Seamus Doyle, together with Sean Etchingham, were allowed to travel and meet Pierce in Arbor Hill Prison to confirm the situation. And following the surrender, he was then arrested and sentenced to death, but which was later commuted to penal servitude. And during the War of Independence, he was elected unopposed under the Sinn Féin banner to Dáil Éireann in 1921 and stood for the anti-treaty side in the 1922 elections. Another well-known Sinn Féin figure was um, John Etchingham. 
He was a journalist for the Inniscorty Echo since his foundation in 1902, and during the Easter Rising in Inniscorty, he was Brigade Commandant of the Volunteers, and he accompanied Seamus Doyle, who we just spoke of, to receive the Order of Surrender from Padre Pierce in Arbor Hill. Now, similar to Seamus Doyle, he too was also sentenced to death following the Rising, but this was later changed to prison time. And he was elected in the 1918 election for Wicklow and, and was re-elected unopposed in 1921 for Wexford. And during the War of Independence, his home in Core Town was damaged as a reprisal for the Inch ambush. And he took the anti-treaty side in the general ele election of 1922, failing to be re-elected. Dr. James Ryan came from a very Republican family known as the Ryans of Tonkool. While studying for the medical profession in Dublin, he became a co-founder of the Irish Volunteers. And he joined the Irish Republican Brotherhood. He was involved in the Rising in Dublin, was subsequently arrested and later released. He was elected as a Sinn Féin candidate for the South Wexford constituency in 1918 and was re-elected in the 1921 elections unopposed and was also vice chairman of Wexford County Council in 1920. And during the War of Independence, he was the Brigade Commandant for South Wexford and he stood as as an anti-treaty candidate in the 1922 elections, but lost his seat. John Byrne was a native of County Wicklow and stood as a pro-treaty candidate in the 1922 election. He was an educated man, um, having graduated from the old, old Royal University in 1907 with an MA. He later worked as a civil servant, first in London, before being transferred to the Land Commission in Dublin, eventually leaving the civil service though to study law and being called to the bar in 1911. His law background was recognised as during the treaty negotiations he was appointed a member of the Constitutional and International Committee to advise the delegates on matters concerning international law. He was also on the committee which drafted the Free State Constitution. He was a member of Sinn Féin and the Gaelic League. In the years following the 1922 election, he was appointed a High Court Judge, later Attorney General, and in 1940 served as a Supreme Court Judge. Two Labour candidates will contest the election in County Wexford in June 1922. The first and better known of these was Richard Corish. He was a leading figure in 1911 during the Wexford lockout, after which he became subsequently involved in the Labour Union movement. In 1913 he was elected onto the Wexford Corporation, and although he took no part in the 1916 Rising, he was arrested and imprisoned, being transported to Frongock in Wales. He was elected mayor of Wexford Town in 1920. Now, although he was involved in the labour movement, he had obvious Republican sympathies. Examples of this is seen when he refused to take the oath of allegiance or recognise the British government or crown once elected. And he removed the resolution condemning the 1916 rising from the county um, Wexford Council minute books. Now, during the War of Independence, he received death threats from black and tans and British officers. In 1921, when Labour didn't contest the election, um, he stood as a Sinn Féin candidate and was elected, and he voted for the treaty in January 1922, and would later win an, a landslide victory later on that year in the June 1922 elections. Now, the second candidate which stood for Labour in County Wexford was Daniel O'Callaghan. Daniel lived in Court Street in Inniscorty at the time of the election and he was employed as a railway clerk and his father also worked on the railways. Now, similar to the Labour Party, um, the Farmers Party ran two candidates in the elections in Wexford in June 1922. And the first of these was a man by the name of Michael Doyle. He was a farmer from the old town in Tagote and he appears to have been active in politics before the 1922 elections. As was noted in his obituary, which appeared on the 12th of September 1942 in the Free Press, that he was a member of the Wexford Board of Guardians since 1898, a member of Wexford County Council since 1910, some of which he was chairman, while also being on other council-related bodies. In February 1923, his home was burned by masked men, most likely anti-treaty IRA, during the Civil War. The second candidate for the Farmers' Party was a man by the name of Michael Jordan, and he was originally from Bally Hamilton in the north of the county. The influence of the pact between De Valera and Collins is evident in the reporting newspapers, with Sinn Féin candidates calling for unity. The Echo newspaper on the 10th of June reported at a meeting held in the Athenaeum in Scorty on the 1st of that same month, Seamus Doyle, speaking in both Irish and English, highlighted the need for national unity. He also spoke of the resolution of the Ulster question, the restoration of order and the constitution. 
Sean Etchingham similarly was concerned with unity. The strength of the pack is, pact is further evident in the fact that pro and anti-treaty candidates encouraged people to vote for their counterparts. At a meeting held in the Wexford Bullring, pro-treaty candidate John O'Byrne encouraged the electorate to vote for their counterparts, for, pardon me, for his counterparts, and this was reported on the 17th of June in the Echo newspaper, and I quote, Concluding, Mr. O'Byrne appealed to the electors to cast their first three preference votes for the panel candidates and to give him their last. He promised to, promised to support them with his life to the last stage in the fight for complete independence. They also sought to calm fears, and during the same meeting, it was argued that the treaty would not be enacted until December and that other elections would follow, with Seamus Doyle encouraging people to support the old flag again in the present grave issue. Rivalry between the parties is noted in the run-up to the elections. At a meeting in the Market Square in Escorty, Seamus Doyle referred to both Labour and the Farmers' Party involvement in the election as a hindrance, it would appear, towards achieving a peaceful resolution. He's quoted as saying, In voting for the farmer and Labour representatives, the people were not making for peace. They were paving the way for civil war. A Mr J. H. O'Connor from Timon, who was Director of Elections, also addressed the meeting and said that the Farmers' Union was not used in the interests of the farmer, but in the interests of the Conservative and landlord classes. In a meeting in the Square Ferns on Sunday the 10th of June, Dr Jim Ryan noted the differences which existed between Sinn Féin and the Farmers' Party for not stepping down. And he's quoted as saying, did anyone imagine that the volunteers would take orders from the Farmers' Union? They would only take orders from those who stood by them during the last three years. He did not wish to say anything against those who were opposed to them. All he would say was that they were opposed to the wrong party. They could have had representation in the third doll without an election if they wished. At a Sinn Féin meeting in Kiltili, a Mr C. McCarthy, a farmer from Morntown, is quoted as saying, that um, he had been a member of the Farmers' Union, and from what he observed, it was run by colonels, majors, and even generals of the Great British Empire. The Farmers' Union was out to break the spirit of the people, that it was being engineered by the Freemason at their headquarters in Dublin, who were trying to sow the seeds of dissent. Speaking at a meeting in Timon held on the 11th of June, Sean Etchingham spoke about his opponents, referring to one of the Farmers' Party candidates, and I quote, The Southern Unionists were running men like Mr Doyle and using the Farmers' Union for their own purpose, and to have Ireland held for the British Empire. At a Labour meeting held in New Ross Town, Richard Corish spoke against the idea that Labour should not have contested the election. He is quoted as saying, any parliament that was going to be set up in the country would do no good for the people unless there was a strong and healthy opposition. He further placed emphasis on the need to look beyond internal arguments and the treaty. And he's quoted as saying on this, the Labour candidates knew what the workers wanted and they were going to strive to get it for them. If they wanted a good ordered government in the country, they should get away from political squabbles and do something practical for the Irish people in the way of developing industries that would provide employment and dealing with the housing and other grievances. They had had enough fighting and it was time to set about building up the nation. The Farmers Party also held their own views. Michael Doyle, speaking at a meeting at the Redmond Monument in Wexford Town, stated, the farmers' candidates were not out to abuse any other party or to indulge in mudslinging. Their view was that everyone should do their best to secure a prosperous Ireland. He is also quoted as saying, it was, astonishing, it was an astonishing thing that while railway clerks, professional men, clerks and others should be seeking representation in the Dáil, the farmer should be asked to stand down. In his opinion, and he believed in the opinion of a good many other people too, they had had enough of the politicians and it was about time that the farmers should have men from their own class who would not be deterred by any movement, whatever, in pleading their cause. 
Addressing a crowd outside Ballandagan Hall, and Mr T McCarthy, who was chairman of the Inniscorty Urban Council, referred to the change in the voting system. Now, it is important to remember in this context that during the last election in 1921, the majority of candidates ran opposed, meaning that no actual polling took place. Um, consequently, for many voters in the South, this was their first experience of the new voting system then. And you can see his address here on the left hand side of the screen as it was reported in the echo and it says that the forthcoming elections mr mccarthy continued would be conducted on different lines from the last parliamentary election on the last occasion there were two candidates and the people were asked to vote for one opposite whose name they were to put a cross on the present occasion the people have to remember there was only one constituency county wexford not North and South Wexford, as before, and that there were four candidates to be elected. They were to be voted for on the proportional representation system, with which most of the people were already conservant. On that system, no cross was to be used on the ballot paper, but the voter should mark it one, two, three and four, according to the candidates he liked best, second, third and fourth best. So you can see this would have been a change for many people at the time um, and was something um, new for a lot of people so it was important that they were aware of this. Election day in County Wexford on the 16th of June 1922 passed off generally peacefully with a couple of exceptions. At Kyle shots were fired into the boot with the presiding officer and poll clerk lucky to escape. The IRA guard returned fire and an armed guard was called from Wexford town and placed thereafter. Similar occurred across the Bagan Barn town. One of the candidates, Michael Doyle, um, who was a member of the Farmers Party, had a car stolen from his yard by armed men on, in, on the morning of the election around 1 a.m. It was later found abandoned and damaged, having been used in other interests during the day. At Kelly's Hotel Ross Lair, um, said to be used in the conveyance of presiding officers, cars were towed away by raiders, but were later recovered. It was reported that in urban areas, cars were used to convey voters. Instances of personation were also reported, but in small numbers. Um, tragically, two deaths all, were also recorded on the day of the election. A Castle Bridge and Mr. James French died of a seizure shortly after casting his vote. And in Rosslair, Mr. James Doyle um, dropped dead after entering the boot. On the election results, the newspapers reported 34,327 votes were cast out of a total of 48,000. Of these, 1,341 were spoiled and the quota was designated as 6,593. Richard Corish topped the poll, being elected on the first count, receiving 11,694 votes. After the distribution of his surplus votes, Michael Doyle was deemed elected on the second count, having reached the quota, but his running mate Michael Jordan was eliminated and his vote distributed among the remaining candidates. On the third count, however, none of those remaining met the quota and this resulted in Etchingham, who had the lowest number of votes on the count, being eliminated. In the subsequent fourth count again, none of the candidates reached the quota, with Daniel O'Callaghan just 233 votes short. Consequently, the lowest in the fourth count, John O'Byrne, was eliminated, and his votes distributed among the remaining candidates, being Dr Ryan, Seamus Doyle and Daniel O'Callaghan. On the fifth count, Labour's Daniel O'Callaghan reached a quota with a surplus of 148 votes. And in the two remaining counts, the final surplus votes were distributed, resulting in Seamus Doyle receiving 654 votes and being elected, and Dr. Ryan receiving 5,960. In analysing the results of the election, the Echo newspaper reported a large number of spoil and doubtful votes. It noted that few people appeared to grasp fully the possibilities of the new proportional voting system. However, it was noted that a large number of voters showed clearly that they voted for the candidate they personally approved of rather than for any particular party. The election was a success for Labour with only a single Sinn Féin candidate being returned for County Wexford. Pre previous prominent personalities such as Dr Jim Ryan and Etchingham had lost their seats. And the election was a success for the pro-treaty side as both Labour and the Farmers Party supported the treaty. 
I hope you enjoyed this talk on the June 1922 elections in County Wexford. And if you'd like to find out more about the decade of centenaries, you can visit the library and archive website shown on the screen. Thank you very much for watching and goodbye.